Good morning, everyone. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we come to you begging for patience, honoring your glory, and watching for your return. We pray that you be with us as we continue to minister to those who are hurting. Give us a heart to help. Give us a hand to hold. We pray that in these days ahead, that you give us forbearance, you give us a mind to take into consideration the others around us and to always minister in your name. Be with this church as we continue to worship and be with all of us individually in our daily lives as we draw closer to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood Jesus, not a good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. We come now to that part of our worship service when we pause uh, to focus upon the focal point of what worship is really all about. I know that we're all disappointed that we uh, had uh, to postpone the in-person worship for one more Sunday, but in the inter interim we thank God for all these electronic devices that helps us to remain in contact, contact and to be able to gather, in a sense, around the table of the Lord. You know, everything that uh, happens in, in time as we move toward eternity, all of the things in New Testament Christianity have a history. The history of God's uh, redeeming humanity in Jesus Christ began at the Garden of Eden. And the promise that God made in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of uh, the serpent would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. 
Now, it's not just any woman, it is a specific woman. And uh, that is what the scholars, scholars call uh, the uh, proto evangelium, the first statement of, uh, of uh, evangelistically of the plan of God. So we come from that moment in the beginning of recorded history up until then the end of time. And in that interim, God is doing something always uh, to have a focal point of communion with the people who are his. He did so with the patriarchs and uh, they, none of them fulfilled uh, the, the uh, promise to redeem humanity. And he did it with Moses and the law, with all the sacrifices and with the day of atonement. But finally, as they come out of the Egyptian bondage and he establishes the concept of the Passover and does that with uh, unleavened bread and the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. When Jesus comes, as we see in Matthew 25, to have the last supper, as it's called, with his uh, apostles. He takes the bread and he breaks it and blesses it. And he says to them, this is the blood, this is the my body, which is given for many. As we partake of the bread today, will you bow with me in prayer? Dear God, we thank you that we come together even in this way. And as we pause to remember the body that Jesus lived in, that he left heaven and uh, became one of us and dwelt among us, and that he suffered in that body a terrible and deliberate suffering. And we thank you that our Lord did come and to do that for us. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. At the same time, at that Last Supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. God is a covenanting God. His agreement with Adam and Eve was a covenant type agreement. He had a covenant with Noah. He had a covenant uh, uh, with uh, Abraham. And that covenant became the promise the promise that God would have through that uh, uh, progency of Abraham and the nation that would come from it, one that would come into humanity and live with us and face temptation like us, and that he would then live a life without sin and that would be holy, and that he would pour out that blood in a sacrifice, a human death, for human sin, which the Hebrew writer tells us the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, but this Lamb of God took away sin. It's the blood that brings us into covenant relationship with Almighty God. Let's pray. We, we, Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine. We thank you, Father, for the whole aspect of the communion service that Jesus transformed the Passover into the Lord's Supper and the focus of communion with you through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we partake of this uh, uh, cup, help us to do so remembering that it represents the blood that paid for our sin and reconciled us to you. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I've heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I 
feet may fail and fear surrounds me. You never fail and you won't start now. So I will call on your name. Keep my eyes on the way. Rest in shame, rest in shame. Hello everyone. Have you noticed how anxiety and worry has become such a common occurrence that we fail to notice its dark side? <laughs> we often treat anxiousness like our phones. We can't live without it, nor do we intend to. It often becomes a badge of honor defining our every move. And it's easy to be worried, to be anxious. We look around our world and there's ample reason for one's anxiety. I mean, right? We're living through one of the worst pandemics this world has ever seen. Will I catch the virus? And if I do catch the virus, will it have lasting implications on my health? Will the vaccine be effective? How has the virus affected my family? How has it affected my work, my education? How, how has it affected my walk with God? Am I stronger in my faith or weakened in my faith? We also have a new president. No matter, no matter what side of the coin you prefer, we wonder what our future will be like under this new administration. And while I, and while I don't want to clump everyone into the same mold, most of us have moments of anxiousness in our lives. We can't get rid of the distress, the uneasiness which occurs in our minds, the fear that threatens the very fabric of our faith. We're anxious people. And our anxiety is known by God, is it not? <laughs> our anxiety is known by God. And, and does he like it? No. Now, he understands it, but he doesn't like it. Why? Because our anxiety is in direct competition with one's faith in the Father. The level of one's anxiousness defines the potency of one's faith. So, do I trust my life in the hand of God? Do I trust that he will take care of me in those moments of uncertainty? And why do I continue to worry about that which I have no control over? But we do. We do. We often misplace our faith with fear, with anxiety. I get it. I get it. I do. Our anxiety makes a lot of sense in a fallen world. Anxiety and worry are human experiences for which we all struggle. And all of us at some level ought to be able to sympathize with others who find themselves bogged down in the pit of despair. 
We can sympathize with others because we have been there. You know, we all want quick answers to the ambiguity of life. We do. But, but let me throw out this principle. Deep struggles of uncertainty, they don't have quick answers. All right, let me repeat that. Deep struggles of uncertainty don't have quick answers. You know, often those things for which we worry are long-lasting things without, without an end in sight. And there are a million, million different outcomes for which our minds have traversed every option multiple times. And yes, yes, we know it could all end tomorrow and all that could go away or it could last for years. Thus the uncertainty of life. And this is where God meets us. He meets us in our struggles. Jesus meets us in our worry and asks us to trust him with our troubled soul. Listen to this verse. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is grace. And our worry is helping us move into a deeper understanding of faith. If you recall from the lesson from two weeks ago, we spoke about the do nots. Do not do that, but do this. It's very prevalent in Jesus' kingdom sermon. And in this passage we are discussing today, Jesus instructs his followers, do not be anxious. And to get his point across, he repeats do not be anxious three times. Three times, not once, not twice, three times. Three times, do not be anxious. The word anxious is used six times in ten verses. Okay, so listen to the longest discourse in the Sermon on the Mount regarding any topic. It deals with anxiety, with worry. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith! Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So do you think anxiety and worry were a struggle in the days of Jesus? I mean, do you think... They worried where their next meal would be coming from. I was reading this the other day, the 4,000, feeding the 4,000. That was 4,000 plus the men, the women and children. They were following Jesus and listening to his every word for three days, three days. They haven't eaten, and Jesus has compassion on them and feeds them. Jesus feeds the 4,000 plus. See, Jesus is grace in our worries, helping us to move to a deeper understanding of faith. Many in the days of Jesus were worried where their next meal would be found. They worried about their clothing. They worried about their taxes. They worried about their health. They worried about the political environment. Does any of this seem familiar? Jerry is one of our guests who shows up at the building every two or three weeks asking for food. The essentials to get his family through the next few weeks. Our food pantry is there to serve him and other guests who arrive asking for help. Do you think Jerry worries about food? Absolutely. 
There are many in this world who do, who do not have the necessary means for their family, especially during these days. And I wish I had time to enlighten you on how our local food bank assists thousands of clients daily. Many clients are those who hold an hourly job but don't have the means to place food on the table for their entire family. You may remember there was a Facebook request a couple of weeks ago by one of our members.